So let's start off this lesson with the product law. Now what the product law states is that when you're looking at a limit with x approaching a of a function where it is two different functions being multiplied together. So here we have f of x and g of x being multiplied together. Then what you can do is actually take the two functions and find the limits of them separately and then multiply them. So as you can see, uh, there's the f of x here and there is the g of x here. And what we did was we got the limit of just f of x, but we multiplied it with the limit of just g of x. And you can do this so long as the limit as x approaches a for f of x and the limit as x approaches a for g of x both exist. Now, if either one of them don't exist, then we can't use the product law. So with that being said, why don't we try a question together to get used to this idea of, of using the product law when we're finding the limit. All right, so in this question, we have if f of x is equal to x, that's a pretty simple function, and g of x is equal to x plus one, then what is the limit as x approaches two for f of x times g of x? Well, in this case, f of x and g of x is already presented to us. So all we have to do is, let's start by specifying what f of x and g of x is and rewrite this. So we have limit as x approaches two for x multiplied by x plus one. So once again, you can easily see this as one function being multiplied with another function. And so long as these two functions separately have limits that exist, then you are able to use the product law. So if you're trying to use the product law and then you realize that uh, either your f of x, one of the functions, or your g of x, the other function, simply does not have a, a limit, then you have to stop yourself right away. Just make sure that you're, you're not using the product law in that situation. In this case, I'm gonna go right ahead and tell you that the linear function uh, y equals x, the linear function uh, y equals x plus one, they both have limits that exist uh, when x is approaching two. Okay, so what did the product law say? Well, it said that you can literally take the limit of just this right here and multiply it with the limit of just this right here. So if we do that, we get the limit of x as x approaches two multiplied by the limit of x plus one as x approaches two. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the left, what you have is one of the basic limits. You know that as x approaches two, the limit of x is gonna be equal to two. Mm -hmm. Multiplied by, now how do we get this limit on the right side right here? we get that limit? Well, you might remember from the sum law that you can actually just separate this to the limit of x plus the limit of one. Of course, the limit of x as x approaches two is gonna be equal to two. And the limit of one, well, the limit of a constant is just the constant itself. And therefore, that's gonna be one. So two plus one and uh, that uh, simplifies to three and you get two times three is equal to six. So what we have in the end is through the use of the product law and actually in the end we also ended up using the sum law, good thing we learned it, we were able to without even drawing the graph at all, we were completely able to find the limit as x approaches two uh, and we found that the limit is actually six for this graph which is pretty cool. Now, similar to the product law is the constant multiple law. Now I'm gonna explain what the constant multiple law is all about, but one thing for sure is that it is just a specific scenario of the product law. So if you don't want to memorize more than you need to, you really don't need to memorize this one. 
because it's it's just so to speak it's a subset of what we already learned with the product law and i'll show you why later on but for now why don't we dig into it what this one says is that the limit as x approaches a for a constant multiplied by a function is equal to just the constant multiplied by the limit of the function and of course in this scenario, we need to make sure that the limit as x approaches a for that function f of x exists. And if it doesn't, then we wouldn't be able to use the constant multiple law. So let's start off with an example. So in this example, we have the limit as x approaches 5 for 3 times x minus 2. So as you can see, uh, we have 3, which is a constant, multiplied by a function x minus 2. So this is a great scenario for us to use the constant multiple law. The limit of a, a constant, well, that's always going to exist. That's because the limit of a constant is a constant. And the limit of this linear line, well, that's that's always going to exist. So uh, what did the constant multiple law say? Well, you can literally, so to speak, you can take this, this multiplier out. And you can do three times and then the, the limit of just the function, which is x minus 2. And if you try to find the limit as x approaches 5 for x minus 2, you would remember that we have to actually use the difference law here. This is pretty easy, the limit of x minus the limit of 2. So the limit of x minus the limit of 2, well, limit of x as x approaches 5, um, one of our basic limits that we learned, that's just going to be 5, minus the limit of a constant is a constant itself, so that'll be 2. 5 minus 2 is equal to 3. So what we have in the end is 3 times 3, which is 9. So that's, pretty, that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, the limit as x approaches 5 for 3 times x minus 2. This y equals 3 times x minus 2. If somebody gave you y equals 3 times x minus 2 and said, what is the limit as x approaches 5 for this? You wouldn't even have to chart this out. Just by using the constant multiple law, you would know right away that this indeed has a limit of nine. That's pretty cool. Now, you might have noticed that so much of this is similar to what we already learned from the product law. And the reason why is that we are essentially doing the exact same thing. The only difference is that the product law has one extra step. So the product law, if you remember, has this step of looking at the three over here as a function and looking at x minus 2 here as a function. And what we learned is that when you have two functions being multiplied together, to take the limit of these two functions being multiplied together, all you have to do is take the limit of the two functions separately and then multiply them. So the product law would start by taking the limit of the 3 multiplied by the limit of x minus 2. Now, the limit of 3, the limit of constant is going to be equal to the constant. So now we're back to 3 times and then the limit of x minus 2, which was the first step of the constant multiple law. So the product law, if you started with thinking about the product law, you would literally do the same thing as a constant multiple law, only you're adding one extra step. And the reason why the constant multiple law is made is that that extra step, this one part, is always since since we're basically saying uh, in the product law, if one of the functions is a, is a constant, then taking the limit of a constant is always going to be the constant itself. So you might as well just have another law saying that if one of the numbers is a constant, then you can just have that number multiply with the limit of the, of the next one. But if you ask me, I'm not really sure why we would actually feel the need to to teach another law on top of the product law when the product law truly does in the end do the same thing. If you understood the product law well, then understanding the constant multiple law is a, is, it's a breeze. So, you know, why not learn it? Because learning is awesome, right? So of course, with that being said, uh, most of the times, most of the questions that are uh, served to you will end up being something that has a lot of algebra in it. But uh, don't be alarmed even if it comes in the form of a paragraph. You just have to really work out what this thing is saying. Think about the laws that you know and use it to your advantage and you'll be able to answer things with ease. So in this example, it says if f of x has the limit of 3 as x approaches minus 2, 
and g of x has the limit of 0 as x approaches minus 2. What would the limit of f of x multiplied by g of x be as x approaches minus 2? So what do you think? Well, first of all, let's, let's try to understand what we just read. If f of x has a limit of 3 as x approaches minus 2, we can actually write this out mathematically. Limit as x approaches negative 2 for the function f of x is equal to 3, apparently. So let's just write that down. Awesome. The second part says that the limit as x approaches minus 2 for g of x is 0. Ah, that's interesting. So let's write that down. And what is the question asking us? It's asking us, what would the limit of g of x multiplied by f of x be as x approaches negative 2? Awesome. So what the question is asking is this right here. And what would that be? Well, we learned that the limit as x approaches a number for f of x multiplied by g of x could be found by simply taking the limit of f of x and multiplying it with the limit of g of x. The only thing we need to be concerned about is, do these two limits separately exist? And they do, because we've actually been given the limit uh, entirely. We've been given the limit of f of x as x approaches negative 2 as 3. Not only do we know it exists, we, we've actually been given the answer. It's incredibly simple. And um, the limit as x approaches negative 2 for g of x has been given as well, 0. 0. So definitely the limit exists there too. We have a number value. It's 0, right? So awesome. So all we have to do is use the product law. And what we get is uh, the limit as x approaches negative 2 for f of x multiplied by the limit as x approaches negative 2 for g of x. And since we have the number values, we just replace them with 3 times 0. And what you get is an answer of 0. So b was our answer. Moving on to the quotient law. And you're going to find the quotient law to be, once again, very similar to the product law. What this states is that the limit as x approaches a for a function divided by another function can be found by doing the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. And of course, this comes with a few uh, conditions. First of all, the limit as x approaches a for the numerator it needs to exist. The same goes for the denominator. Limit as x approaches a for g of x needs to exist. And it comes with one more unique one. And since it, this is a fraction, the limit as x approaches a for g of x, which is the denominator, cannot equal 0. So there's that one extra condition. Awesome. So since we have so much experience with all of the different laws that we've been learning, let's go right ahead and try an example. So what we have is limit as x approaches 2 for 5 divided by x minus 1. All right. So we have a numerator, we have a denominator. The numerator is a constant. You know that there's going to be a limit that exists for a constant. The denominator is a linear function. Obviously, we're going to have a limit exist for a linear function. That's a guarantee. The only thing that you might want to worry about, be watching out for is uh, that this limit does not end up becoming zero. That's that's the only thing you want to watch out for. Now, if it does become zero, then you don't want to use a quotient law, but that's not going to be the case here. So let's see how this rolls out. You have the limit as x approaches two for five. That's a constant. That's just going to equal five. Uh, divided by the limit as x approaches 2 for x minus 1. Of course, how do we simplify that? Well, all you have to do is use the difference law. So you'd have limit of x minus limit of 1, both of them x approaching 2. Uh, limit of x, we already know the number being approached is 2, so let's put 2 there, minus limit of constant, so that'll be 1. And 2 minus 1 is 1. So what you have is 5 divided by 1. And of course, that equals 5. So the limit as x approaches 2 for the, for the graph y equals 5 over x minus 1 is going to equal 5. Awesome. So we have an idea of how to use the product law, the quotient law, 
we, we oftentimes use a sum law and difference law. Now we're going to take a look at exponents and roots um, and how to deal with that when it comes to limits. And then we're going to go into a very, very important topic, which is can we substitute the x? We said that we definitely should not look at the point at where x is to because we already learned that x approaching to is very different from when x is to. But there will be situations where you can easily just substitute two, which if you think about it, it would seem like a very, very wrong thing to do, yet it would yield you uh, uh, the answer right away. And a lot of people, instead of explaining why you can do it, uh, they'll go right ahead and say, just try it. Uh, the difficulty behind this is that you don't know why and when you can do it, so you'll start doing it at the wrong times and then just get confused. So we kind of took you through the more proper way of uh, exploring limits. But in the next one, after learning a couple of the uh, laws that are left for us to learn, uh, we're, we're going to dive into this idea of direct substitution. When can you do it and why can you do it? So that'll be a very important lesson. We will see you guys in that one.